So it's my great, my great pleasure to give a warm welcome to everyone to the KICCP 16 on results-based financing for education system management, challenges and opportunities. You all know that the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange, KICS, Europe, Asia Pacific, EAP, Hub, is part of the overall KICS program, a joint initiative of the Global Partnership for Education and the International Development Research Center in Canada. NORAG in Geneva holds the KICS uh, Europe Asia Pacific Hub, giving shape to its core mission of KICS, which is to promote the use of research evidence for more effective policy, planning, and hopefully better uh, education results for all our education systems. And we are doing this through uniques, the unique approach that KICS has, which is to surface, amplify, and disseminate knowledge and expertise from our KICS AP countries. This webinar today is a step forward in our knowledge exchange agenda in a topic that is in itself an innovation. We are talking about innovative financing for education. And this is a topic that has been increasingly relevant for education systems in our region. Before I guide you through the today's uh, webinar agenda, I would like to compliment the, the, and thank the NORAC Innovative Financing for Education team. Arusha Terway, Private Sector Process Team Leads, Marina Dhufotre, IFE Research Associate, and Anaka Rich Ganesh, IFE Research Assistant, whose work made this webinar a reality. It has been Norad's expertise on innovative financing for education, has been bringing light on the potential that innovative financing has to attract additional funds to the education sector, while at the same time not forgetting quality and equity uh, considerations. And we are pleased also to have today speakers from the Nepal Ministries, Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, the World Bank and the Global Partnership for Education. So our webinar today, and I'll ask uh, Paul to please share the, the agenda. So we'll, we'll be presenting today the latest, research, the latest research on RBF in the AP region as well as having exploring concrete experiences with the use of RBF in Nepal, Vietnam, and in GP partner countries. Uh, Arushi Terway, the private sector approaches team lead from NORAG, and also senior technical advisor for KICS-AP, uh, is joined by Marina Drufote, IFE Research Associates, and also NORAG and KICS-AP male leads in presenting their research on results-based financing in education for sub-national government and school administrators, a presentation that builds from their recent uh, published research study supported by the World Bank REACH program. We'll then have a first Q&A session. After, then, after that, Zhang Vo, senior uh, education specialist at the World Bank Group, will bring us the lessons learned from the enhancing teacher education program in Vietnam. A second Q&A moment will precede the presentation of Hari Prasal Lamsal, Joint Secretary of the Nepal Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, and also KICS-AP National Steering Committee member. Uh, Dr. Lamsal will be sharing the results-based financing experience in the Nepal education sector. Following another space for Q&A, Rafael Martinez, Education Policy and Learning Team Lead from GPE, will share the experience and application of RBF approaches at the Global Partnership for Education. After this last presentation, we'll have a longer Q&A until the webinar closing remarks. I just remind you to please feel free, please feel invited to share any questions, comments during any time the webinar in the chat box. Our webinar is built to be an interactive knowledge exchange session. So we want to hear your experiences, your doubts, your comments during our uh, webinar, our event today. With no further delay, I give the floor to my dear colleagues, Arushi Terway and Marina Dzhu for uh, their presentation. Thank you, Jose Luis, for that introduction and walking us through the agenda for today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Arushi Terway, and I'll be presenting the research that NORAG has done with the support from the World Bank REACH project last year on results-based financing, mainly for education sector management. Um, 
uh, my colleague Anika will share the link to the full report in the chat. So please do go and read that because we are only presenting a very short, brief overview of the entire research. And I hope you find this useful today. Uh, so innovative financing often uses results-based approaches. And that term is thrown around a lot. I want to make sure that we all are on the same page with understanding what results-based financing really is. Results-based financing is when a financing agency, whether it be a donor or the national government or any other institute that's financing education, uh, only gives the entity that is doing the work payment after the results are achieved and are verified in, independently. This means the money only comes after the program has implemented and achieved some results. Often you have heard of this at the national level where donors are giving results-based aid to countries in education, but it does happen at other levels too. You all must have heard of uh, performance pay for teachers or school directors, which is at level four over here. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so level four over here where teachers and school directors get payments as well, which is results-based, um, or students and households get conditional cash transfers to actually access education or improve their learning outcomes. What we are going to talk about today in this research is really the middle level where often national governments or donors pay local governments, whether it be municipalities or district education authorities or provincial authorities or directly the institutions, schools or higher education institutions, a payment for reaching results. We wanted to study this area because not much work has gotten done in this area and moreover, very little research actually exists in this on experience. So we wanted to collect all the experience that exists in this area. Um, one thing that we did was first establish why results-based financing is meant to achieve better results and use the financing more efficiently. This is all grounded in the principal agent theory. So the economists in the room, you will probably understand this well, but let me simplify this for everyone else. There's a principal that wants some work done, and there's an agent that will actually get the work done. So principal pays the agent to do the work. They are both self-interested parties. Principal wants to maximize the amount of work that is done. Agent wants to maximize the amount of payment that they will get. So that relationship always exists in a results-based financing approach. Then the results that are achieved have to be independently verifiable and observable by all so that both the principal and agent agree that the results were achieved. The agent is meant to have more autonomy. The principal does not dictate how the agent receives the, uh, reaches the results. The agent is supposed to be able to do it on their own and have that freedom to figure out how to reach the results. And then the principal pays them some kind of an incentive to actually reach the results. And if they don't, uh, the incentive, disincentive is that they won't get any payment. How did we look at it? We did a systematic literature review where we collected about 700 documents and then found that 128 documents talked about this issue. Then we also did a review of 51 projects around the world that are implementing this type of um, mechanism. And then we had global surveys and key stakeholder interviews. I'm going to pass it on to Marina to explain what we found here. Thank you, Arushi. So uh, as Arushi said, as we looked at all these different resources and also the practical um, uh, initiatives of RBF uh, at this middle level of education management, we did find uh, some differences in uh, theory and practice. And I'll address some of the challenges that we've seen with this difference uh, right now. So the first of them is the existence of multiple principal agent relationships. So while uh, in the RBF contracts, as Arush explained, there is an agent and a principal well-defined. In reality, there are multiple reporting relationships at various levels of the education system. And you can see some of them uh, in, this, uh, in this image. Uh, so one example, uh, while the agent is reporting to the principal, it is also responding to the needs of students. Uh, 
in an education system. Another example is that in many cases, the funding for the RBF contracts is originating from a donor organization who has a separate contract with the national authorities with also its sets of objectives. So in practice, what we see is that agents end up needing to respond to multiple actors who may or may not have aligned objectives. And this has the potential to weaken the overall incentives for the agent to deliver results uh, and also in that contract specifically. And in addition to, the, to that, another level is that the agent will need to provide incentives for its individual employees to contribute towards uh, that re desired results as well. So let me pass to the next one. And then a second challenge we found is the needs uh, for operational funds. So if payments are only made after the achievement of results, the agent needs uh, some capital to fund the activities, right? So we've seen that this is particularly difficult for subnational actors uh, in the public education system, which already have recurrent expenses and low levels of unallocated funds. So in practice, in nearly half of the initiatives we studied, we've seen that a large portion of the payments is made based on commitments, uh, agreements, uh, or improvement plans. One example is the SINS education sector project in Pakistan, uh, where the payments were released upon establishment of better employment conditions in schools. All right, so then we found also a third challenge, which is the difficulty in defining results. So we all know that defining results in education uh, in general, it's very complex, uh, but changes in learning outcomes in particular do take time to achieve, and it's often difficult to attribute them to the actions of only one actor in the education system with whom the RBF contract is established. And these, uh, Difficulty means that education projects not very often use only outcome measures or use outcome measures at all. So uh, instead, we've seen that the most common type of education indicators used in the initiatives that we studied are related to student participation, uh, for example, school attendance, uh, and the other common type of indicators are related to management processes, so preparing school development plans, for example. So what we see is that the principle is often incentivizing efforts and the process to achieve results instead of paying for the results itself. Uh, there is, however, merit in this as well. So having these milestone indicators, it does help in uh, supporting incremental change in the education system that might eventually lead to that desired uh, education outcomes. And then uh, we come to the last challenge we've seen um, in, in these differences in theory and practice of RBF, which is the lack of agent autonomy. So we found that there is frequently uh, low levels of autonomy of the agents in such RBF contracts, especially in terms of designing the activities that do lead to the results of the initiative. One example is the India Odisha Higher Education Program. Uh, where performance agreements were signed between the Department of Education and the tertiary education institutions with a detailed list of activities that the institutions needed to perform in order to receive the funds. In this case, we see that the agent did not have much freedom to change the activities once the agreement was in place. And these low, low degrees of autonomy we see can be explained by a trade-off. So, for the agents to have greater autonomy in managing tasks that they believe will be, uh, will be the ones effective in leading to results, the agents also need to take an increased financial risk of receiving payments only for results achieved. When they do not have the appetite or when they do not have the means to take this financial risk, they may be, they may be willing to forego some level of autonomy in exchange for more funding reliability. So, this, uh, this is a trade-off that we see in all the contracts we looked at. But there is another challenge, which is that greater autonomy may also come with an increased workload. Uh, a research in Chile found that under RBF agreements, agents had their workloads increasing significantly, leaving them with less time for other important tasks as well. 
So uh, as an example, at the primary and secondary school levels in Chile, in order to meet enrollment targets, school directors had to spend on average 24% of their time just before performing marketing tasks to attract students. So uh, those are some of the challenges we've seen. But uh, in then, sorry, I think we moved one slide back. Uh, but while addressing this challenge, you also came up with a few recommendations uh, that Arushi will now address. Thank you, Marina. Um, I'm going to take one extra minute. My time is uh, up, but one extra minute to give you some key recommendations coming out of this research. So overall, results-based financing will not solve all problems in education, but when you are implementing it, there are a few things that have to be taken into consideration. And uh, ways to make it more useful. One is absolutely do a situation analysis and figure out if there's a culture present in the system that is conducive to results-based management. Is everyone convinced? And then if it, they're not, what else is needed to do that? So build in a program that has other elements. Create a shared theory of change with everyone in the system. So when you have multiple agency working on the same thing, they all should know exactly how results-based financing will help achieve the results. Um, define the targets that are transparent and objectively measurable that has to happen and use the institutional systems within the education system to measure and verify them. So you don't have to pay extra often to an independent company that comes out and measures all of those things. Create an incentive structures for employees within the system that are both financial and non-financial. There are some examples where an award system for employees great, great motivator to achieve the results. Pay attention to capacity building and technical assistance to help everyone understand the results-based financing mechanism and results-based management on its own. And think about sustainability, whether it's about sustainability of the results, as in improved learning outcomes on its own, or you want to institutionalize the results-based financing approach within the system or not for the long term. So I will leave you just with this for today and happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much, Arushi and Marina. And I think it's this is a great way to set the scene for the webinar today. And we have already uh, some questions and we have and it's continued to come a lot of questions in the chat i'll start by the first question that we we receive from Kletus chizanga uh, executive director of the youth care and community prevention programs in zambia and uh, he's asking why is that financing education programs is often limited to ngos is it not as you may think it is in the development country so he's saying donors are usually the, the, the main implementers in this uh, uh, kind of innovative financing uh, and resource-based uh, financing uh, mechanisms. If you can share uh, your, uh, your view of why it is that it's often a donor or an NGO implementing and not the governments. This is the question that Kletus was, uh, was asking. Either Marina or Arushi, you like to put it. Um, I will try to tackle that uh, to the best of my understanding. In the examples we saw, it wasn't always just donors using results-based financing approaches. There were lots of country governments also using innovative financing approaches and results-based financing within it. And it, can, it really has the flexibility on sometimes it's for NGOs, but a lot of times what we saw was that it was local government authorities that were being that were the agents that they were the ones achieving the results and re receiving the payments so there there's a variety of it and if you go to the actual paper the uh, of this research the annex has a giant table of the 51 programs that we looked at where you can see different examples of who was the financing entity, who was the agent, and what was the actual structure for re reaching the results. So please, I encourage you to take a look at the paper. Okay, thanks so much, Arushi. We have now two quick practical questions that I want to bring. From Nepal, from Kathmandu University, 
uh, Salpa Shastra is asking us, who are the agents here? Can you give some examples? I think it's something that we need to uh, try to address uh, the, in practical terms, what examples of agents. And then Shodibek uh, Kodirov, who is our coordinator in Tajikistan, he asks examples of uh, results in secondary education. What kind of results we could, ex we could expect? Is it achievement or something else? So two practical questions, and then we go for another round of questions. Marina Arushi, please. Sure. So let me uh, try to address a little bit the question on the different agencies. So, uh, of course, in every RBF initiative that we looked at, there was a different arrangement. And we've seen that uh, agents were in different levels as well. So uh, in the initiatives we've seen, uh, there were a lot of actors in the public education system. So local governments, municipalities, uh, and school managers or school principals that were the agents of in the contract. So there was a principal could be the the uh, government, the the regional governments could be the national governments as a principal. But different units within uh, the national education systems were uh, working as agents for that. And we also have seen uh, actors that were not uh, in the public education system, so like service providers. Uh, any uh, NGOs uh, as well could be uh, taking up this role of the agents in this uh, level that we were looking at, which is the subnational level. So I don't know if that addresses your question or if you had a question in a specific uh, initiative as well, but please let yeah. us know in the chat. I, yes. I think it addresses, Marina. Um, do you want to address also examples of results that we could be achieving in secondary education? Yes. So, of course, uh, we uh, a lot of the initiatives that we looked at were uh, looking into uh, were aiming to achieve learning outcomes results. But we've seen that in practice, uh, a lot of the indicators used the results. In, let's put uh, the immediate and intermediate results uh, that were aimed to be achieved were results related to participation. So, like increased attendance, uh, increased survival rates for different grades. Um, also some uh, important management processes that might uh, uh, ultimately contribute to the improving of learning outcomes at the school level. So incentives for teachers as well, uh, access uh, related indicators, but ultimately uh, all of these uh, most of these projects, not all, but most of these projects were aiming at improving learning outcomes, but having different milestones to get there as well, as, uh, as uh, especially addressing the difficulty uh, of uh, seeing improvements in learning outcomes in the short term. Marina, thank you for the examples. We have so many questions now, it's going to be difficult to pick and choose, but we'll read a couple of more and then we'll save some of these to the longer Q&A. Um, I'm trying to go uh, chronological here. So we had a question from a university uh, in Brussels, uh, Karen Trique, and she says, would you say that this increased workload of achieving results, even, even when we are giving more autonomy, is unique to RBF? Uh, one could argue that any educational change will demand significant increase in workload to stimulate, to stimulate and achieve uh, any change results that we want. RBF or any other uh, program. Arucci, you want to take the lead on this one? Absolutely. You're right that any education program that is coming from the outside and putting on demands on the agents that is outside of their regular work will create that additional workload. However, with RBF, theoretically, the idea is that they get more autonomy, so they get to decide how they do achieve the results. And that autonomy itself should help them make sure that they reduce their workload but still achieve the results and they're not doing the process that is dictated from the outside. So there's just a expectation theoretically with RBF that people would be very happy to take it. However, a lot of our interviews did actually mention that institutions were not ready to take this extra money because that created this extra workload. And they, in an RBF program, they almost had a, had the option to say no, and they said no. Uh, so there were lots of examples where institutions were not ready to take the money because they had increased workload. 
So it's it's not that it is any different from other education programs that increases workload, but the expectation of RBF says that they wouldn't refuse it. But in reality, even in this situation, they are refusing the workload. Or when they do take it, they're still suffering from one lack of autonomy, which was expected to happen in RBF sometimes. And then if they even if they have autonomy, they don't want it. Thank you so much, uh, Arushi. We have here many interesting questions, but in the interest of time, I'll give it to the, I'll, we'll move to the second presentation. We're taking notes of your questions. We'll have time at the end to continue our knowledge exchange. So I'm here, I'm, I'm, I have a pleasure now to give the floor to uh, Song um from the World Bank. Please, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to hear the experience with RBF in, in Vietnam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, wherever you are. Uh, can you see my slide? We can see, but it's not in presentation mode. Yeah. I hope it's coming now. Okay. Not yet. Okay, now it is. Thank you. It's it is. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share the experience we have in education. Uh, in Vietnam in result-based financing in this webinar. So uh, within the next 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to share a bit about why a result-based financing, or so for the banks, our terminology is program for results, but eventually it's result-based financing. The second part is uh, the designing of an enhancing teacher education program, or in short, ETEC. And the last one, I'm going to go through uh, some implementation challenges and the lessons learned. So the first one, let me introduce very quickly the background of ETEP, um, of the Enhancing Teacher Education Program. So in 2013, our ruling party, the Communist Party, as uh, you may all have known, adopted a resolution for fundamental and comprehensive education reform. And these constituted a political and legislative umbrella for broad sector reform, sector-wide reform. And the priority of the reform is general education and, and teachers is the center of the education uh, reform. And the Ministry of Education and Training in response to this resolution established a program called National Teacher Education Program, NTEP. And um, this program is really to enable the teacher education to adapt more effectively to the changing needs of teachers and principals, because the reform is really about shifting the general education towards competency-based education. So at that time, between the government of Vietnam, in this case, Ministry of Education and the World Bank, we decided that um, the continuous professional development for teachers is the most critical element of the reform that need to be supported uh, from the bank, uh, given that at that time, our pre-service education was recently well established. Um, so the, um, so why uh, enhancing teacher education program was uh, a, a PFOI, a result-based financing instrument um, using the result the financing instrument. So there are a couple of reasons, but one of the most notable is it's moving from input base to the result base. And that encourages the government to focus on very specific sector results that are catalyst, but also can leverage on the entire reform process of the government. Um, the second one is um, the financing instruments uh, aim to support the implementation of the, the national program. And therefore, um, the, pro the program can build on the existing fiduciary uh, environmental social system. So it minimizes all the uh, transactional costs for a normal project-based um, uh, uh, mechanism. And the third one, eventually the P4R instruments would voice to the capacity of the ministry to implement 
um, and manage the entire education reform through its own system via regular technical assistance and implementation support by the World Bank. So the implementation arrangement of the program was actually embedded in the former sector uh, structure. So the Ministry of Education and Training was responsible for the strategic management of the program and by extension, the strengthening and institutionalization of the continuous professional development mechanism um, and at the provincial level, we have 63 provinces. So at the provincial education management levels, they're responsible for undertaking the overall quality control um, of the uh, CPD process, continuous professional development uh, process for teachers. And at the institution level here, we have teacher training universities selected to be responsible for the implementations of the CPD improvement that is envisaged by the national program. So the overall arrangement was very instrumental for ensuring the system-wide implementation and systemic improvement. And it's being the capacity of these concerned actors has been supported by the technical system that provided, as I mentioned earlier, on a regular basis. Um, and not not least, last but not least, it's very important that the P4R basically provides strategic financing for key sector results. Now, the, um, the financing of ATEP support the Ministry of Finance in Vietnam uh, to ensure that the government agency utilize the overseas development assistance based on a unified and coherent programmatic framework. So let's talk a little bit about the design of this um, uh, program for results. So as like any other bank's program, we always start with the theory of change that we discussed with the government back and forth. And here is not only the central government, also the provincial government, where the, uh, the teachers, the millions of our teachers are. Uh, it's also the long discussion back and forth with teacher training institution who eventually having that hands-on support on a day-to-day basis, and then come up with this um, theory of change. So the program was designed to enhance teacher education to have teachers more effectively adopt new methods and competencies with a long-term goal of improved student learning outcomes and increase adult labor force participation to support Vietnam national development goals. So ETAP aims to reinforce the continuous professional development for teachers through two main vehicles. So in every school, 30,000 schools in Vietnam, one core leader, one, one core teacher is selected. And in a cluster of school, one principal is selected. So like one out of six or one out of seven principal or school leaders selected to provide the mentoring and coaching support for their peers. And the second vehicle is that uh, uh, they built an online platform that to provide the need-based and interactive training and support directly to teachers and principal. And to ensure the dynamism and quality of the CPD system, eight teacher, what we call lead teacher training university was selected uh, to, to, to be trained to build the capacity and provide the support to core teachers and principal advisor. They also developed the online services and applications and have developed the needs assessment system. The lead teacher training university uh, will provide a technical uh, leadership and guidance for the school-based CPD system. So um, the, the program have four main resource areas. And um, this resource area was part of the National Teacher Education Program. And it constituted the principal strategy for establishing an effective and functioning CPD system that could provide school-based support and training to teachers. And these four result areas associated, as you can see, with five disbursement link indicator, in short, we'll put DLI. And for each in disbursement link indicator, there are one or two disbursement linked results. 
that will trigger periodic disbursements. So for the sake of the timing, um, I will only focus on result uh, area one and DLI one. Um, so in the first results area, um, which is the improved, as you can see, is improved capacity of the lead teacher training university, LTTU, and central teacher management units, which is the provincial uh, department of education to enhance teacher and principal education effectiveness. And we have a disbursement link indicator, which is the institutional capacity of LTTU to support the new CPD system for teachers and principal enhance. So eventually this disbursement link indicator, let me show you, has been allocated most funds. It's 28% of the total fund of the 98 million US dollar loan from the bank. Uh, we did that because we want to incentivize the achievement of the uh, TADI score of the score that the lead teacher training university have been committed to achieve. So in here, together with the government, we develop what we call a teacher education institution development index, where the university will be invested to build a capacity and measure the progress of the development every single year against these TEDDY scores. And they, at the beginning of the program, uh, the eight teacher training institution have to sign a performance contract of performance agreements with the Ministry of Education and Training, indicating or committing the targets that they're going to deliver during this program. And the, uh, and the targets uh, includes um, the TADI score over the, uh, the period of the program. Uh, it includes the number of uh, core teachers and principal advisor that they're going to train and also support them to support the, uh, their peers in the school. Um, and also, uh, they also need to come up with online uh, training platforms. So um, the results are verified by an independent verification agency, which is the, uh, a national quality assurance uh, agency to ensure that the results are measured not only quantitatively, but also quantitatively. So I receive a, 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 a sign from Arushi that my time is up. So let me share, let me take an additional one minute to share the challenges when the uh, implementing the P4R. Um, so there's many challenges because this is the first time that Vietnam Ministry of Education implemented a result-based financing um, um, operations. Um, before they all very much relied on the bank technical system for the prior review, now they eventually have to do it themselves and really exposing the risks of not being reimbursed if the results are not achieved according to the agreement uh, that they signed with the Ministry of Education. The second one is the verification protocol took very long time to uh, develop because it needs to include the quality uh, measure uh, as well as the quantity measure, as I mentioned to you earlier. And the final challenge, which is very big also, is that the disbursement link results have to be adjusted twice during the implementation because there was a big take up in using the education technology from private sector uh, to support the government in putting in place a learning management system and teaching education management information system. So the government shift to using, to rely on the private sector to provide that services instead of doing it themselves. So the challenge uh, is cost that then the DLR have to modify and adjust it accordingly. So with that, we have a few lessons learned. Uh, I have to say it overlap with what um, Arushi uh, last slide. Um, so the first one is that we really need to pay a lot of attention and dedicated a lot of time to ensure the relevance of the disbursement link indicators. It should be uh, clearly defined with, um, you know, 
uh, including the amount allocated, the scalability, the disbursement calculation formula, but the protocol to verify achievement have to have clear data source, verification uh, procedures, and, and we also need to be very reasonable about uh, the expected achievement, as well as it needs to closely align with the result framework. The second lesson is that the performance contracts that the university gone with into with the ministry are very critical because it's hold the institution, even though it gives a lot of autonomy for the university to deliver on the results, it's also held them accountable for the quality of the result they deliver. And that is well, very well received by the university and the ministry in Vietnam, because eventually it motivates the university to ensure uh, the internal quality assurance system uh, are always being exercised to ensure the quality of the results. And finally, the technical assistance and regular support will always have to be in place. So we end up at having the ETEP program is one of the seven lending operations in the bank over the last nine years is the only operations that completed on time and successfully. Thank you very much uh, for paying attention and my mom around for taking any questions. And thank you, Arushi, for giving me additional time. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. It's so important that we don't want to, to stop. We want to hear and learn from your experience. We have interesting questions in the chat, and I want to start here by a question that we received from Kathmandu University, Salpa Shasta, and uh, asking what were the verifiable indicators to measure the effectiveness of the training? Was inclusiveness taken into consideration while designing the indicators for the output outcome? This is the first question we have. Um, yes. Thank you so much uh, for the questions. So um, for the training, there's a lot of um, quality indicators, as I mentioned to you earlier in the presentations. Um, and this is a very uh, a long process that we discussed with the ministry, but also with the university. So the indicator includes, um, so the ministry and the banks uh, established a quality assurance um, system for both training materials development and the delivery of training. It relates to both the uh, inclusiveness um, uh, element within the training materials. So whether it's uh, gender sensitive materials, but it's also about uh, the selection of the core uh, teachers and, and core principles. So the, the ministry produced um, a set of policy in how to select them and how we encourage the female um, principal and female uh, teachers apply for the um, uh, principal advisors and core teacher uh, positions. So the effectiveness of the training also measure by the completions of the, um, uh, not only by the completions of the assignment, and the assignment is at the end of the training, they have to produce a coaching and mentoring plan. And that mentoring plan have to be signed off by the principal of the school. And then there's a survey when the verification agency come and ask the um, teachers and principal in the school on what's the support that they receive from the core teachers. Um, so that is, also sets the indicator to measure the effectiveness of the training that teacher training university deliver to core teachers. So it goes down to the satisfactions of the teachers when they receive the support from the core teachers. Now, another measure that we have is also the ministry uh, established a new uh, professional standard for teachers and every year, the teachers and principal have to conduct their annual assessment and then assess by the principal advisor and the uh, school principals. Um, and for that, as I put in my last slide, um, the, there's a change in the distinction, uh, the ratio of teachers that rated distinction uh, compared to uh, the annual assessment in 2019-2020 academic year 
and the 2020-21 academic year. I don't know whether I have uh, answered I the think, question. I think you addressed, and unfortunately, this is overwhelming in terms of the level of questions, the level of interest. So we we need to think of further opportunities for us to share this knowledge and to have space for exchange. We have a simple question, but I think it's a question that it's worth taking a little bit more minutes to, to discuss. Uh, it's a question from Sajid Juli Islam, he's from Pakistan. And what happens when the disbursement link indicators are not met? This is the, uh, the question that he asks. Thank you. So um, eventually the projects, um, it, it's excellent questions. So I mentioned to you that eight teacher training university um, signed performance agreement with the ministry. And uh, in the third year of the uh, program implementation, two of them uh, have to be out of this program. So only six continue to go because two of them didn't deliver on the expected um, results. So midway, uh, the government had to change the implementation arrangements for and, and basically give all the tasks to these six um, institutions to deliver. And the program eventually given that because we're working alongside with them and providing regular implementation support, we agree with each other to restructure the and adjusting the disbursement link indicators to expand the time, the implementation time of the DLI. And finally, um, with the six to 20 university, they deliver uh, the restructure uh, results and get all the fund disbursed. But it happens in other uh, program where we do have the funds uh, canceled. Uh, from the total amount when DLI are not met. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Zong, for your, for your presentation, for coming in and sharing your experience. We will move now to and do travel to Nepal, and Dr. Lamsal will take the lead in sharing his experience from uh, with the RBF in Nepal. Please, Dr. Lamsal, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I was muted earlier. Now it's okay. Will you allow me to screen to share my yeah. screen? You'll have rights uh, quite shortly if you don't have Not it. Problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, there are. Uh, Jose, Arushi, Marina, and all distinguished participants in this webinar. Uh, I'm from Nepal. I'm especially sharing the result-based financing in education sector. Earlier, it was in education sector because of time limit. I, I tend to focus on my presentation, especially in education, school education. The first thing, I will, I will not repeat the things which already shared. and. Uh, I have uh, in my slide, I have how do we understood the uh, result-based financing and then what modalities are there. And uh, I will uh, share my experiences uh, practices from the two projects uh, where uh, government and development partners are jointly financed. I mean, the education needs uh, resources. Education requires resources. The concern is that whether the uh, allocated resources uh, been able to produce or not the intended result. There is always question of about the results. So earlier it was input input based financing. Then along the time and, and, and Nepal Education Ministry has also used the uh, result based financing means uh, DP's support will be achieved once we deliver the agreed result. If we do have such results then we can, we can get the fund dispersed from the DPs. So the question is that whether uh, that concept is only applicable to uh, DPs funding or no, government funding can also be used. We can also use result-based financing in government funding. I mean, the simple notion is that first deliver the results, then get the fund. 
I mean, any implementing agency, uh, government can use that, uh, that, that modality. I mean, there are different tools used by World Bank, investment project financing, of course, in Asian Development Bank as well, development policy financing and program for results. I will only talk about the program for results uh, in the case of Nepal. In program for results, as, as shared by earlier presenter, I mean, we need the results. Then how do we verify that results? The terminology of disbursement link indicator is being used. I mean, they are simply an indicator. Once we achieve the results given on that indicator, we will get the fund. That's the, that's the principle. Then uh, we have two projects, a school sector development plan, which was indeed in the uh, this uh, last July. Then now we do have a school education sector plan. Both, both the plan is our continuation. SESP is the continuation of SESDP. And both are the jointly funded by government and development partners. I mean, the, the, what are the objectives or key focus in its school education? This equity, efficiency, quality, governance, management, and resilience. And we use the tool of joint financing arrangement, joint financing agreement between the DPs, development partners, and government. We have a, I mean, we do have bilateral agreement. In addition to that bilateral agreement, we do have joint financing agreement. And in a document, we agree on the um, indicators that they are called as a result-based indicator, they are called as a disbursement link, link indicator. If I use this school sector development plan, broadly, there were three major results like that we agree that improve teaching, learning, and student learning outcomes. I mean, that is the result. This is just one example from SSDP. That is the one result. And the disbursement link indicator are like that. I mean, we can have flexibility to implement several activities as agreed with them. But the results which we are measuring is national curriculum framework revised and implementation, implemented. Once we revise our national curriculum framework and implement, put it into the implementation, then we, we can withdraw some of the money um, from the uh, development partners which are uh, which are uh, linked with that indicator. In the same area, the question will be, how many indicators were there? In school sector development plan, there were 98 disbursement link indicator in our cases. I mean, 98 uh, indicators of them, we are almost uh, achieved and two are withdrawn. And uh, the question earlier was that, what will happen if we do not uh, achieve the results? I mean, we will not get the money. And we lose some of uh, some of the money because of not achieving the, the uh, results uh, is stipulated in the disbursement link indicator. I mean, this is the total amount which is put under that one. The same continuation, this school education sector plan and five-year plan and jointly funded by government. And there are seven DPs, development partners, non-JFPs uh, means other donors are also there. Then we use the terminology of local education development partner group where civil society and non-governmental organization working in Nepal will also be a part. Then uh, this is the modality, let's say that ADB 200 million, then result-based financing means this time earlier, seeing, Individual DPs has their own DLI. From this SESP, what we agree that all DPs will have the common disbursement link indicator. And we, we have a matrix. Let's say that there will be, uh, for example, 80. We are working in SESP. There will be 80 indicators, disbursement link, link indicators. Some of them are devoted to ADV, maybe some for EU, EU, maybe common for both. And once we achieve the results, then we'll get money. That 200 million will be divided into different uh, indicators. Maybe some is the general covenant, means some, is, some, is, some are for uh, basic fund and some are for indicator funds. Then what uh, we have learned so far, you know, uh, this is the most important thing. Some of the questions which are raised earlier, I mean, in DLI, in using the result-based financing, we use we need to use the systemic view, like one plan, one implementation plan, one monitoring plan, one audit report. If we do not produce all them on time, we, we may lose the grant. 
this is we need to have a systemic view rather than individual project one then second one i mean if we are link the results with the long term view of development and sustainability certainly that will make a difference otherwise if we put the result in a small output level that may not seem quite useful for the case of nepal it really de depends upon the capacity of government agencies the earlier question was like that what will happen if we do not produce the result if we do not produce the result we will lose that money and government revenue will be used because we already use the money we, then we will produce the results if that are not as per the agreed level then only revenue will be used and the dp's money we, we cannot get it then so the capacity is the most important part you know capacity of the individual organizational systemic systemic things and we also need to strong regulatory mechanism because results are not only dependent on input sometimes we are delivering the textbooks we are providing training to the teachers but learning achievements are not improved if so learning achievements are not improved then we may not get the that uh, that money which is linked with the uh, you know uh, that indicator so of course we need to database strong because there will be a independent verification of the results we are the implementers dps are providing fund then we need a third party to verify the indicators whether the produced results are valid or not you know if we do have good strong database if we do have good evidence then that will be justifiable otherwise that may not independent verification agency may, may say that no this is not the results which you have produced then at that time also we may lose that money so but you know this is uh, if we do not have capacity if we do not have dedicated staff for the project and program implementation it will be very difficult to achieve that result to communicate with the dps to 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 docu to prepare the documents and all these things we are working at the federal condition so coordination among the different tiers of government are uh, you know very important in nepal the uh, school education are under the jurisdictions of the local government you know they are the real implementer at the federal level we are preparing the plan in consultation with them but local government are the implementer if we do not have coordination between us uh, even federal provincial level then we may not get the result is in agreed time at that point also we may lose that fund we may not be able to produce the results then uh, you know we need to uh, have be openness in policy formulation the term the use local education development partner groups where all international ngos non governmental organizations are also there while developing a plan or while developing the implementation plan we need to get their consent we need to be uh, open to discuss with them it will create the synergy among the actors of education so that will help to achieve the results i mean at the last what i would like to say that we all are working for the children's learning i mean that is the ultimate results in order to get that results we are using that money that is the result based financing and in nepal if you ask we would have good example we have been working since the past and um, there are some i mean things to be improved but in an overall manner the system is getting uh, improved uh, in order to deliver the results thank you my time is over over just say thank you thank you so much and i think it's important points that you mention here the points that making sure that governments development partners are all working together in terms of the ownership of all the results based financing um, programs one question here that we have received from the from the audience uh, dr lamsel which is yes. comes from sorry i said before that um sad Sa Sa islam uh, was from pakistan but now is uh, is the education officer in UNICEF in Bangladesh and asks, uh, I'll, and I'll be reading the question now, funding is not very much a problem as donors supported to the host government for quality improvement of education in all aspects, but key challenges is expenditure, like in least developed countries. How and what areas require more spending except revenue heads like teacher salaries, infrastructure development? Uh, in Bangladesh, adequate budget education available, but it hasn't been impacting the spending. If you can share a little bit the issues that you've been having with the overall uh, uh, needs for financing and how 
RBF has been some it has been a solution for this and how you, see, you know and how you the experience yeah, thank you thank you Jose. RBF itself cannot support you know uh, the um, increasing the budget I mean th this is a negotiation between development partners and government if we do have more budget then we can we can use that money uh, to to build the infrastructure provide training and materials and all these things RBF is a tool to channel the fund I mean to to to, to you know uh, to motivate the implementers to produce the results or in another way we can say that to put pressure for the implementers to produce the results then rb this result based financing simply does not increase the funding but the clear indication is that whatever amount of funding is available there if we do not produce result only government there will be a pressure in only government uh, revenue because we, I mean, RBF is a tool where we already use, I mean, first we will use the government money. We will put, we will expand the government money at the local level, I mean, at the school level. Then we will go to claim that money with the development partners by showing the results in that particular indicator. Means that if we do not produce results, the pressure will be only for government revenue because we cannot get, get that money back. Then second question is that, what is the overall situation? I mean, in result-based financing, we have the use this joint financing arrangement. Some budgets like teacher salary, scholarship, test books, others are grouped together. Then the, the amount of money contributed by the development partners are also shown in the document, government document. And the, all the amount is merged together. Then we will put into the implementation. Of course, the sources of budget will be there sources of budget will be there, you know, for the teacher salary, we cannot use the donor money. For the teacher salary, we use the government resources. For the textbook distribution, we can, we are using the donor money like this way, we need to differentiate there. So uh, it, it is a tool I, I, I would like to say. And if we produce results, then we can have a, a good bargaining power with the Ministry of Finance to increase the uh, budget. Or yeah. to increase the budget with the development partners, but itself it will not increase the budget. I think it's you put it quite nicely in terms of the connection to the question we received from the university in Belgium, and the, the question is quite extensive. But I'll try to focus on the key points. And the, the question that Karen Trickett has has uh, included in the chat is how does how does or how can the program for results approach? <clears throat> account for results in the long term in our partner countries. We talked about the funding needs and the government's responsibility as well. Is If you see from your implementation perspective in Nepal, there is, there is in a way to take into account the educational change cycle. So the longer term indicators that you aim to achieve. So uh, for example, linked to your presentation, the improved learning outcomes over time and teaching approaches, system strengthening. If you see that this is possible, and then a second part of the question is, is this, is this a limitation for program for results? I think I have seen this current uh, question to everyone. I mean, whether it will have a long-term uh, sustainable development or not, it depends on the types of results you are agreeing with the development partners. If, 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 if you agree on result like number of classrooms to be constructed, that is the output level indicators. So once the school buildings are constructed, you will get that money. But if you agree on that, learning achievement will be increased by this number or this number, or teacher training by this number, or social audit in place. I mean, if you agree on such indicators, such results, then certainly it will help to the um, uh, long-term development of the education system. I mean. Result-based financing itself is a tool, but it depends on the types and nature of indicators or result we agreed before the uh, before uh, um, the implementation starts. Like let's say that one one example I would like to say we have in ADB we have a we have one indicator like that social audit mechanism and social audit disclosure at the school level will be taken place. Guideline development is needed there. Training to them is needed, their capacity development is needed, there. the result, what we agreed there, the independent verification team will go there, and every school has a social audit mechanism. They will sit together, they will produce result, and they will display it. 
If that happens, then we consider that next time it will also be happen and that will be the uh, system uh, will be in place. We, I mean, it depends on the capacity, uh, bargaining capacity with the development partners, whether you agree on the impact level result, outcome level result, or output, simply output level result. If you have outcome level result, uh, if you have system level result, certainly it will be uh, helpful for the system strengthening. Thank you, Dr. Lamsel. Sorry, I think Jose Luis ha is having some technical difficulties, so I will take over. Uh, Dr. Lamsel, you made a very good point on how important it is to agree on what the results should be with all the stakeholders before embarking on a results-based financing program. Thank you very much. I am going to move to Rafael Martinez from Global Partnership for Education for her reflections and experience on results-based financing from GPE. Rafael, over to you. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Abushi. Um, I mean, that was quite a fascinating discussion so far. So I'm going to try to situate the GP's use of result-based financing models in support of systems transformation. And I think our colleague from Nepal made a very eloquent point um, about the fact that what we want to achieve is uh, a, systematic, a systematic view. So our new operating model and our 2025 strategy were developed with the mind of achieving results at scale at systems level in a bolder way. So trying to be more forceful and disruptive to business as usual. I mean, like in the in the in the things and the way that we were delivering um, aid. So for us, I mean, clearly, transforming education systems require ambitious effort to align all elements of an education system behind priority education reforms. And um, education systems are complex with different actors pulling in multiple directions, often also with opposing priorities or stakes. And that misalignment within the education system can act as a break on delivery. So what we're trying with our new uh, model is to incentivize system transformation that would include the implementation of sustainable solutions at scale, for accelerating uh, the delivery of quality education for every child. And so that would mean transform education systems that are responsive, resilient, and robust, and that would innovate and learn. And so for that, we have um, discussed or like suggested um, a critical pathway to system transformation. It's a five steps approach that is not standardized but that like mainly five key principles that have to be contextualized to the country where we work. And the five steps that um, we are identifying in a, in, a, in a pathway to system transformation begins with assessing on the basis of the existing evidence and data, the performance of a sector, understanding what works actually signaling what works well or what doesn't work and what are the major dysfunctions. And on the basis of that, getting in a more um, in-depth understanding of the specific obstacles to reforming the system. So diagnosing what are the major bottlenecks. And then once the major bottlenecks are understood, prioritizing, having one key focus priority reform with the maximum potential to catalyze systems change. And with that, the trick or like the ambition is to have the stakeholders and the resources align behind that priority um, reform. So removing the disincentives, building a shared momentum, trying to align the resources that can be technical, financial, operational, et cetera and identifying the reform that would have the ripple effect over the entire system. Um, and for doing so, it's a matter of like remaining agile, using the evidence that is available, the data that is available, collecting data for staying uh, abreast of the implementation challenges, for instance, and being in a position of course correcting uh, things in a quicker and agile way. And I guess if I'm spending just a bit of time for um, describing that critical pathway to system transformation, the way that the GP model operates, 
It's because it does resonate with practices that we believe are BF integrator support. So let's say, for instance, what I was discussing about putting evidence and data central to implementation, aligning actors. I mean, those are things that our presenters discussed um, a lot in the in the first presentations. So for us, result-based financing is only one of many tools in our toolbox of our operating model to achieve system transformation. And it's seen as an integrated element to support reforming a system. So it's not design or thought as a standalone intervention, but it's a modality that is embedded in a broader reform agenda that would pertain to um, other dimensions of the system. And so really, and I'm going to insist on that a lot, the key points of our model, but also the use of the RBF modality is to leverage more results, catalyzing more results than the one that we are directly financing, that we are that are directly linked to our financing, to our disbursement. We had a former model, um, um, a component, a result-based financing component, component that we call the viable parts. And the ambition was similar. It was about selecting a strategy in an education sector plan and related indicators to achieve sector level results where we would be putting a price tag. I mean, always, I mean, when I'm saying we, it's actually all of the process is always led by the governments in consultation with the education stakeholders at country level, but where indicators would be uh, linked to, to, to disbursements. But it was disconnected from the grant that we would be directly financing. So it was an additional element. We had the grant, and then we had that viable part that would be selecting sector level indicators in the education sector plan. And it could be completely disconnected from the grant that we were financing to be a little bit more tangible. Um, it would be like, for instance, if a grant was mainly about teacher reforms, it could be that the viable part was completely disconnected from the implementation, implementation of the teacher reform, but using other aspects and dimensions of the education sector plan, where the country felt that um, a result-based financing approach would lead to acceleration of results. Um, so we recently conducted a very rapid review of eight of the grants of I mean, the countries where there's been an implementation of those of that viable part. And, and we've seen results, we've seen positive results. And just to, I mean, state a few, like for instance, reduction in out of school children in Cambodia and Nepal, an increase of the number of qualified teachers in deprived area that would be seen in Benin, Liberia, Madagascar, and also internal efficiency improvements in disadvantaged areas and districts in Bawe, Cote d'Ivoire, and, um, and Cambodia. Because those were the three areas where we wanted the strategies to be selected, and that was in um, efficiency, equity, and, um, and learning. So we've seen results, but we, we observe results but we can't attribute them to the RBF modality per se. And as I was like trying to, to get my thoughts organized for that webinar, I was thinking that it would actually be a good area for further investigation to see the comparative merits of using a, an, an RBF approach compared to like more traditional ways of doing things. And I'm not saying that we should have a counterfactual with very rigorous RCT-driven impact evaluations or anything like that, but really seeing like in comparison to more traditional ways of delivering aids and, and, and trying to implement um, um, programs, maybe, maybe buying into implementation science and, and getting to understand like a little bit better what is the motivation of actors that would be sensitive to incentives and not only financial, but I'm gonna get back to that. Uh, so that's just a question that I'm putting to the community um, and I'm gonna come back to that. So what we observe under the new, um, I mean, some of the lessons that we drew from the implementation of the former model viable part, that <clears throat> the positives are that when we're using an RBF approach, it does lever, I mean, it does stimulate dialogue during grant design and implementation. And in particular, 
um, it helps refining the program design and the result and the result chain. It's really putting a lot of attention on building a sound result chain and paying attention to the articulation of the different components. So in a way, it's already like um, supporting um, a mind shift as looking at things from a systematic lens and trying to 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 project some system thinking when developing uh, a result chain and a theory of change. It does also incentivize strategy implementation, um, including across like indicators that are at process or output levels. I'll get back to that. And, and also like one of the lessons is that capturing a realistic ambition is an art. Um, putting RBF, for instance, on learning outcomes, outcomes may appear as like a risk. And I'll get back to that as well. One point, like in terms of more of the negatives, maybe um, it comes with additional transaction costs. Um, so, I mean, at least I, I don't want to speak in general for RBF um, programs, but like the way that we were designing the viable part led to additional transaction costs. So we decided to limit the number of strategies and indicators. Um, and also one other aspect is that the financial incentive has to be big enough to be appealing. So it's a matter of balancing the additional transaction of developing the viable parts, the RBF element of our model, with um, the total amount that is attached to the RBF component. So for this reason, for instance, now the minimum value of a grant where in the new model that we have, where an RBF is used is uh, $15 uh, million. So the new model, I've been referring a lot to it, what's different? Um, I guess what's, and I'm hoping that I'm gonna make sense when I'm explaining that. So I explained that under the former model, we had a grant and then we had that viable part that was attached to sector level indicators that was just like taken out from the education sector plan. Now it's fully integrated into our grant process. And so our system transformation grant, which is our new, uh, a new way of channeling uh, grants. So we call it now system transformation grant, but like completely integrated and embedded in uh, the theory of change that is supported by the system transformation grant. And why is that so? Because we have a model that has evolved. Now the model is, met, is meant to completely get towards system transformation. Like everything we're doing is meant to support system transformation. So in a way, there is no longer that need of disconnecting our RBF element from the main grant because the main grant itself has the ambition that we were initially thought under the under the that we initially thought under the former model, which is results at system level. And just maybe a quick reminder, um, because it might not be understood by um, the audience, but so GPE, the secretariat level, so I mean, like where I work. Um, we're not a direct operator. We work through grant agents that are the implementers of our GP grants. That's um, just to clarify that. But so how it works. So you have a certain percentage of the country allocation that is disbursed against results. There is actually also a top-up mechanism that maximizes a country allocation, and that is also linked to results, but I will not discuss this aspect of the model here. Um, although one could claim that it's an RBF um, modality as well. But what I'm discussing here is the new version of the viable part. So the country decides on a number of indicators when the targets are met in an objectively verified way. Um, the percentage of the allocation is disbursed to a country as additional financing to the initial allocation and the ongoing system transformation grant that is being implemented or it could also be an additional program with a new grant agent, for instance. Raphael, if yeah. you can kindly ask that we wrap up within one minute so that we, we can I'll take do that. All the question, please. Sure. Your yeah. So a few reflections, I guess, um, and I'm going to try to be that, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I would probably like call our model like a meta RBF model in a way that like we're voluntarily lose on, it's, it's a loose construct. 
uh, that is based on key principle, we're incentivizing the partnership in the context sensitive way for working together and delivering as one. It's not like a model that is specific to actors, operators. We're not seeking sophistication or complexification in the way that the incentive scheme is being built for um, responding to what uh, like certain actors needs, et cetera. The premium is put on the overall partnership to work together. But there are still important level um, discussions, like the level of indicators of disbursement. There's different schools. We've been seeing that through the through the through the through the former presentations. But I mean, for me at least, it's almost a false depths because we're putting things in perspective, whether in a theory of change. So whether an output, an indicator is process or output or outcome level doesn't really mean a lot by itself. It only means when we're resituating things in a result chain and the system transformation that stakeholders are thinking together. What matters more is our effective use of the tool to drive the implementation and, and to move forward that theory of change. And so, yes, so we feel sometimes that we're not in space where emphasizing putting money on outcomes is actually sometimes safe. And I'm saying that because we need to have some careful consideration of the likeliness of disbursement. And finding the right balance of indicators to keep the motivation of the financial in incentive in a way that doesn't impact negatively the implementation. The question is less about disbursement itself, but it's about like how to drive actual implementation. And we are not, we don't want to be setting countries to fail. We want to support the implementation and service delivery. We want to be able to disburse the money, but with a reasonable level of ambition. And so I guess like the question is, um, um, like what education, what education challenges are better addressed through RBF? Um, and I'm asking that question because we know that, for instance, and it's in relation to the point that I was making before, if we're putting RBF on learning outcome targets, we know that it's not going to magically lead to improved learning outcomes. So for instance, you take that my French is poor, and if you promise me $1 million, and that like I would read, uh, would reach a fluency level in French by next week. We all know that that target is impossible to reach. And even if you promise me 20 million, it's not going to happen. And even if you give me three years to get fluent in French, it's not gonna get, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that we we don't want to lower the level of ambition, but but we need to find the right challenges that would be incentivized with an RBF mechanism. And one thing, just a word of conclusion, because I think also the colleague from Nick Pal was reflecting on that um, eloquently. I guess now that we have the um, RBF element completely integrated into our system transformation grant, and that's also in relation with the discussion on the level of ambition that we want to have through our indicators, one risk is that that could lead to some like projectizing things, um, being satisfied with buying direct um, intermediary results, for instance. And if we would be doing so, then we would just become a supply payment model, like uh, for instance, like dispersing against that number of school being constructed. But this is, that would be defeating the purpose that is like placing the dialogue and the premium on systems level results and developing, nurturing that systemic, uh, systemic view and, and, and systems lens. And I'm stopping here, thank you. Raphael, thank you so much for your presentation, for giving us the perspective that GP and the, the depth of knowledge that you have from the implementation in all of our GP countries. And you already responded one of the questions we had, which was exactly on the risks of uh, RBF. One of the questions from our audience. We have here, uh, I think it's, a sort of a compliment from Bangladesh as well, where it's uh, there is a, a thank you note for GP support with the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh for the way that you have been able to set up GP's assistance and the GP funds for achieving the expected results in a flexible way. And the comment here is from uh, Saad Sa Sa Jul Islam is that it is essential to spell out the output level results, which will well, which will in turn lead to achievable outcome results, if you could comment. 
So it is essential to spell out the output level, the ones that are more in our control sphere, which will in turn lead to the chief outcome results. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like I said, there's plenty of opinions on the matter, even internally in GP. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, I mean, our model is country driven. So it's really up to the stakeholders around the policy dialogue table to agree. I guess what we want to incentivize is that long term view, what we want to achieve together, what is the systems level results that we want to see happening. And then if we have that in mind, developing a theory of change that is sufficiently sound, articulated, uh, based on evidence of what works, what doesn't work, from former implementation, for instance, et cetera. And then finding, again, like I'm saying, it's not a science, it's an art. It's, it's a policy dialogue, I think. It's quite critical, actually. It's also a policy dialogue, gauging the appetite around the table of the different actors. And maybe I should have explained that a little bit more, but the, I mean, the GP model itself is a multi-stakeholder model. So we want to have all of the type of operators around the table, and we want them to be discussing together. And throughout that dialogue, maybe identifying what are the, like, the pain points or the key points that would actually work well with uh, financial incentives. And again, like I'm not sure whether we need to get into so much details about that discussion, what is the level of indicators, process output outcome, because eventually it's all relative, right? Like in a given theory of change, depending on what you want to achieve, one indicator in a given context will be output when it's going to be outcome in another context and in another theory of change. So I'm not sure whether that matters so much. What matters is definitely not a good level of ambition. So it's still a stretch. It motivates actors to, 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 to do things maybe differently and to get better at things that we're doing. But that is not like so irrealistic that the disbursement may just fail because this is really not what we want to have eventually. We want the money to go to the country to, to support further implementation. Thank you so much, Rafael. Um, I just want to announce that we are now at the time that we're supposed to close the webinar, but given the, given the variety of questions, the interest from the audience will extend for 10 minutes. And now I will be asking that all speakers are free to come in for the questions that now we are starting to, to pick up from, from before and also the question now. Of course, uh, Rafael, uh, please also you uh, take the lead in some of the questions you think are relevant to you. There's a question here that just came from Salpa Resta from Kathmandu University in Nepal, which I think it's an important question that we should address is, should capacity development of the implementing partner be at the core of RBF? Or is that an option? So, so I open up for Rafael, Arushi, Marina, and all, and all the other speakers here in the room to address this question. Um, yeah, so I should, yeah, yes. you know. Now uh, it's open to all speakers, yes. Okay. Uh, absolutely, but I don't think that's specific to RBF, if you ask me. So, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a matter of like developing the capacity. So, like any aid based financing is actually sustainable in a medium term and longer term. And, and so, yeah, very short answer, central, but to absolutely any aid investment, I guess. If I may uh, also join Rafael on that, I completely agree. And uh, in the different uh, 51 initiatives that we looked at, we've seen that a lot of them had a capacity, uh, development capacity strengthening uh, element to it. Even if it's separate for, from the RBF agreements, it is part of the same program. So we've seen that uh, while there are uh, payments coming after the delivery of results. There are many inputs and supports uh, that is being included in the design of these programs for, for those results uh, to be achieved and for the implementing agents to be able uh, to keep improving and delivering the agreed results. Yeah. I can comment um, eventually for Vietnam. Um, the very first indicator is to measure the capacity building of the implementing agency. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Arushi, please. I want to add in a practical example from, I think this was an institutional development program in India and in Africa, where the 
agents that were failing to meet, meet the DLIs, they received additional capacity building to make sure that in the next iteration, they were able to reach the DLIs. So RBF mechanism itself was used in a way to really identify the weaknesses in the system and then really hone in capacity building for the, the weaker institutions in the system. So there are ways to even use RBF itself to do capacity building. So thank you so much. We have here, I'm trying here to pull up together questions from um, that are within the, the same topic. There is a question that addresses context and do you know how context is important? And we saw how my context also because of the internet, I had to disconnect and come back and apologies for that. But there were questions is how RBF is applicable in humanitarian emergencies? If that's something that you think can be applicable given that not only humanitarian, but conflicts, I think here we can spread it as well. There was also a question that came, if RBF could be used for primary education uh, of refugee children. So if you could address this, of the validity and how context is important for the RBF and in specific particular complex uh, contexts as conflicts as emergencies as refugees if you think RBF is one of the solutions is one of the tools who would like to take the lead on this one um in the yeah. programs in the programs that we looked at um Unfortunately, we did not find very specific programs on RBF in cases of emergencies. But Raphael, maybe you have some more experience with GPE giving funding in the fragile states. And if any RBF has been tried there, it is more complex in, in, in situation and emergencies because monitoring the results in those situations is a lot harder. The availability of data is a lot harder. Would you have any examples, Rafael? Uh, no, well, uh, not necessarily. Also, because I'm not sure whether I mean, like, um, I mean, we work, of course, at the nexus of like emergency and development. But our investment, our developments, clearly developments. So um, I guess um, we have fragile contexts. I'm not sure whether it's an answer, but uh, with the new model, for instance, we've been waived a number of countries that are facing fragile contexts for applying the RBF element of our model. So I guess I'm answering the question in a way. Um, like when there is too much, yeah, too much okay. element of fragility, we think that it's risky. And so we're not pushing for RBF. But it could be contradicted by some research. So, I mean, like for the moment, that's the approach that we're taking and we're very much open to evidence anyways. Um, although I should say that we have that top-up mechanism in the new format, in the new model, but it's just like so, yeah, it's, it would be a hard discussion to have right now in one minute. Um, so let's keep it for next time. Okay, if no, if no other speaker wants to, uh, come in now. I I want to connect here two questions that came on sometimes the unintended impacts some of our initiatives in education sometimes take. And there was a question earlier from Nigeria, from Osai, and also a question from our colleague in Norag, Mathilde. And the question is exactly, are there perverse incentives generated? You have uh, yeah, examples of RBF creating perverse examples. How could you try to design RBF so that it's preventing that this from happening. And Osai was also mentioning exactly this in Nigeria, where there were wrong behaviors, where the teachers were going and helping the students to reach their scoring levels in a specific exam. So if you could address how, by when you are designing the RBF programs, you can try to minimize any perverse incentives that can always happen in any initiative that we have in education. So we'd like to uh, bring their thoughts on this one. I mean, yeah, I can start with that one. Uh, so one uh, design elements that we've seen in several um, RBF initiatives that we look at is the existence of an independent uh, verification 
units uh, and that we've seen it taking um, different forms as well. So in a lot of donor funded programs, it's an external evaluator that is coming in uh, to ensure, ensure more accountability uh, in how results are monitored and reported. But we've seen also uh, in other contexts, in national contexts, that these uh, independent evaluation role can be played by uh, national institutions as well. So uh, it is important that uh, uh, these national institutions are also empowered to play that role and can create uh, uh, these uh, trust uh, relationship within the country as well. So uh, these are some of the ways we've seen for um, reducing these perverse incentives. And then there is always the equity question, right? So is RBF always uh, just uh, privileging the top performers, basically. So is it that we are also, uh, we already have those, uh, the, those agents that are already having good performance are the ones that are achieving results and getting the funding. So we've seen in different programs as well, uh, and especially uh, uh, some in Brazil, that there is a, a specific design element uh, that is giving funding to improvements in performance and not just to the top performers. So those are some incentives we've seen as well to reduce uh, some of these perverse mechanisms in, in terms of equity uh, for the system and also to ensure accountability. And Anyone so, else would like to bring? Yes, please. Yeah, please so go ahead. In, the, in Vietnam, we eventually failed to recruit the independent verification agency for three times because we would, were looking for a, a quality uh, assurance, quality management institution to be the independent verification agencies. And finally, we got one. So eventually, um, one of the things that the project program do is that that uh, independent agency eventually um, providing the technical support as well. So as they, they work alongside with teacher education university, supporting them, strengthening the internal quality assurance mechanisms and build their capacity. So that is really, I mean, they have no motivation of cheating or anything because eventually they have the capacity support along the way. Thank you so much. So, so we have, thank you so much, uh, Song. It's been it's wonderful. We had a lot of questions that still remain unanswered. I think it was important that we were framing this as one of the options, one of the tools that policymakers, that governments, development partners have to use to improve education systems. So it's been a wonderful knowledge exchange. I want to thank the speakers and hand it over to Arush Terway for the closing remarks in our webinar today. Thanks so much. Thank you. I want to thank everyone again for joining today. Um, it has been one of those webinars where there are just endless questions and we can have three more hours to be discussing and really getting into the real examples. I encourage everyone to go read our paper. You will find the names of all the projects in there as well, and you can go look at the project documents uh, for those projects. Um, my colleagues will also be sharing the post webinar survey in the chat box, please do fill that out it really helps us improve the webinar for the future and really improve the interaction that we have in these webinars so please do go ahead and do that. I also wanted to bring your attention to an executive course that NORAG is offering through the Graduate Institute in March. This is a course on innovative financing for education and RBF results-based financing plays a key role in this. We will be discussing and teaching lots of different modalities like impact investment, impact bonds, debt swaps, uh, corporate social responsibility, tax reforms, all those topics. It will be taught by myself, Archana Mahendele and Nicholas Burnett, all experts in the field. Um, it is an accredited course, so if you take a few other executive courses at the Graduate Institute in three to five years, you can come out with an executive master's degree, and this course will count towards that. Applications are going to open uh, close on February uh, 1st, 2023, and the course starts in March uh, on March 3rd. If you apply early, that is before December 22nd, you will also qualify for a small discount on the course. The course itself costs 9,600 Swiss francs. 
It's fully online, so you can take it from anywhere in the world. It requires three hours of interaction per week and some hours of independent work. So we have made it fairly easy. If you want to learn more about innovative financing, please apply for this course. Um, a few more announcements. There are upcoming activities for Kix EAP Hub. Uh, we have opened the call for abstracts for the Education Policy and Innovation Conference for 2023. The deadline is December 3rd, so it's this Saturday. Please get your abstracts in. We will also be having. Uh, we will also be releasing on December 7th our new podcast with Shaima El of uh, our Yemeni colleague, who is also a research assistant at American University in Cairo. Please listen to her experience in the field. And then NORAG is having an in-person event. So people who are in Switzerland, please join on December 6th, Mapping of International Geneva Ecosystem in Education. This is not online, so you won't be able to join from Zoom. If you are in Geneva, please attend this. And NORAG's website has more information on how to register. Soon we will be finalizing the knowledge reports that will come out from the learning cycle four on diagnostic tools for improving education policy planning and learning cycle five, teacher professional development at scale. Please look out for those reports because it brings out amazing experiences and proposals from KICS EAP countries around the world. Thank you.